Okay, the uh, first question. I mean, you're you're planning to play close to the edge in its in entirety on the on this current tour. Uh, I mean, this is an album that consistently tops the 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 prog polls as the greatest prog album ever. I mean, did you have any inkling when you were making this album that you were doing something that special, or was it just the next album? Well, uh, halfway between that, I mean, you know, whenever a band or, or a musician makes a record, that record, he's got to think, is potentially his great greatest piece of work. So, yes, definitely thought that Close to the Edge, the record we were working on, was, was, was pretty epic. But, of course, nobody, you know, can't have any idea of its longevity at that time. But we at least thought it was going to get a bigger foot in the door after Fragile, you know. So we were just trying to supersede Fragile with something greater. And John and I dreamed up the idea of the 20 minute piece. So that was kind of what, what established this as a quite a special record. Sure, sure. I mean, it's, uh, I mean, you're doing this album, this wonderful album series you're on, uh, and you've uh, announced that you're going to be playing this album in its entirety uh, this year, I believe. And of course, yeah. the Relayer album has been kicked up the road a little bit. But I suppose my question is, uh, next year, would you not feel compelled to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Topographic Oceans? Well, yeah, we might combine it with Relayer and, and Topographic, not, not playing all of Topographic, because mainly we've only played two sides of Topographic in our album series, side one and side four. Uh -huh. John Davison is mad about side two. He'd love to play side two. I'll um, let him do it. <laughs> we play parts of side four in that we do my cadenza and then leaves of green. So we never completely ignored uh, side three, nice. but uh, we wouldn't attempt the, the the instrumental sections that precede, uh, you know, leaves of green. So, yeah, I mean, we could get into a, a dangerous uh, anniversary <laughs> package, but yeah, we, we, we really do want to do Relayer, but I think what we do is, without preempting any decisions that we collectively will make, you know, yeah. uh, we'll, I think we should play at least one side of Tales to, to commemorate. Sure, absolutely. I mean, it, Tales of the Topographic Oceans, uh, I, I rate up, they were close to the edge as my, my favourite albums. Uh, um, uh, one uh, interesting question I have regarding uh, Close to the Edge, I mean, how, much, how big of an influence was the Mahavishnu Orchestra on the, when you were composing uh, this track at all, I mean, or if at all? Well, um, over those few years before it, we'd, um, well, I mean, look, we all admired John McLaughlin as a guitarist and, and sure. he did some great things, but somehow Marvishan Orchestra was, was a high spot even in his career, you know, because of its commercial success and, and also because of its, the strength of the members, you know, like, yes, it had yeah. very, very powerful members and sure. each of them was an individual. So, um, I think what happened was we we did do a few shows with them live and that kind of cemented the admiration that particularly John and I had for for John and the Marvish Orchestra. So certainly the influence was there and certainly the way Close to the Edge, the song, starts is definitely uh, a, a sort of a, a nod to, to Marvish, just because who would think, you know, a, a rock band would start like that? Sure. <laughs> we, we sort of start in the depth of some you know, a thing that only we know where we're going, uh, improvisational, structurally very sound, and thematically as well, heading to a theme. So yeah, I, I would say Marvishna had, had, had a fair bit to do with us uh, at that time, instrumentally. Oh, sure, okay. Uh, Melody makers Chris Welsh described, um, my source is Wikipedia, by the way, I don't know how reliable that is, but he described the atmosphere during the making of the album, Close to the Edge, that is, as stressful with outbursts of anarchy. Is this is Close to the Edge proof that conflict can be positive, creatively speaking? And do you remember things being fractious when you made that album? OK, well, uh, this, this one's come around to haunt me a few times. Uh, basically, I, I don't particularly agree with Chris on this one. Um, now, there was the, the, the main tensions were really between Chris and Bill. Because you know, Chris Chris was methodical and kind of slow about getting his parts together. So as Bill was sort of getting parts together, Chris was thinking, "Well, I don't know. I might do this. I might do that." In his great grandiose sort of way, which always got great results. But oh. along that path, if you like, 
uh, Chris managed to wind Bill up quite a bit, saying things like, "Well, look, in the chorus, I, I, you know, like dot my dot my beats here, you know, don't, don't don't play those beats, but play mine." And Bill would get quite adamant that that he was not going to take orders from Chris like twenty four seven. He'd he'd accommodate some logical necessities, but he didn't want Chris to to overrule his his uh, drumming, you know. Oh. So, um, but the team is a bass and drums is a team. And you have to have those uh, pretty tight, you know, like they were on Fragile, to to make it kind of like really sound authentic or, you know, uh, convincing. So um, I, I think that that there was so many highs in, especially the con construction of a new and I took hours of rehearsal room going da 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 or no da 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 you know to find how the band was really going to portray those two themes that I believe Bill Bruford wrote. So basically, there was an awful lot of time, and it was slow. And I think Bill most probably, I never would have thought it at that time that there was a difference between Bill and, and the rest of the band in one respect, because after all, he left to go to, to play with King Crimson. Mm -hmm. So in a way, we had a, a much longer commitment to yes. None of us were going to leave yes, you know, as we were finishing close to the edge, but Bill did. So I think that might show you that, that some of Chris Welch's influence has come from Bill's comments. And, nice. and I respect Bill for saying that. I mean, he, he, that, that's the way he saw it. But I think with John and I having written Roundabout and, and collaborated on some other things, when we wrote Close to the Edge, we, we were, I wouldn't say we were forceful, but we were very determined that, that we could do this, you know, and we were going to help direct the band to, to increase their belief. So um, it, I, I think it was a very, uh, I was going to use the word harmonious, I would say it, it, there was a balance of the harmoniousness of John and I really believing in this and, and the workload that that would take to, to invent it, record it, perfect it, overdub it, you know, the whole thing. So, like I say, I think, I think that does come from more from Bill's attitude than, than the rest of the band. Sure. I mean, in Bill Bruford's uh, autobiography, he talks about his frustrations with um, Chris for his constant lateness. And to the point that he would actually make his own way to gigs because he was worried about being in a, in a road accident, uh, like Fairport Convention, so to speak. Was it really that? Was that a real source of tension in the band or was it just for Bill? Well, even in my book, I, I kindly don't keep going on every chapter about about the the aggravation that it caused and the, mm -hmm. the sort of the feeling that the four of us had about anybody, you know, and, and it was Chris, anybody who who repeatedly had no regard for for time you know sure. in, in the sense of uh, of being late and and i remember once on a quite an early american tour it was snowing outside and we were leaving the air leaving the hotel for an airport and guess what <laughs> chris got them downstairs um, the plane was going to be loading soon and we were still at the airport so the kind of frustration but the worst kind and this happened very often was chris was actually late for the show so being late for the travel was one kind of thing and i mean i love chris you know and, and don't get me wrong here but but it was something to put up with so bill was right to point it out and i do in my all my yesterday all my yesterday's book i do mm -hmm. go to there particularly i mentioned the big one i mentioned is, is uh, on the last show of the drama tour which right. was a total wipe up. we were at the rainbow and it was 45 minutes after showtime that chris mm -hmm. arrived so you can see we 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 had a fantastic musician here uh, and but he had one disregarding um uh, you know personality trait which was he didn't care about keeping other people waiting and all of us were were totally bothered about that i mean you know to be late you know uh, and so i think was it sting that said it that he said if you're going to be a musician be in tune and be on time <laughs> that's the only two requirements you've got well chris you know sorry you managed chris, one of them chris was not <laughs> Well, I mean, you know, it's uh, interesting. I mean, Bill Bruford, um, uh, do you think Bill's perhaps sort of a little bit of a bee in his bonnet about that whole thing? Because he seems to talk about it quite a lot in his book uh, uh, as well. Uh, is that the, was that well, the like reason said, he left? Uh, I think his relationship with Chris 
his breakdowns in relationship with Chris w- was a bigger reason. I don't think he he was really trying to get away from John, me, you know, and, and Rick as much as he he felt that you know he he was. Having said that, I always get a feeling to say to you also that if we'd gone on to if Bill had stayed and gone on to do close to the uh, topographic oceans, I. Th- <laughs> I, I think that might have been a bit far for him to go yeah. into those that kind of music. I, I, we, we, like we did with Close to the Edge, John and I did conceive topographic oceans quite, quite vividly, mm-hmm. and we wanted to do mm-hmm. that. And, and I think along that road, Bill may have had another kind of sensation that, that John and I were leading the group into this you know, this concept album and, 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 but Bill, you know, Bill was so great to work with, but I think you've, I, I, yeah, I, I don't know whether we can say much more, but th- there's some indications of, of realities that we didn't experience, mm-hmm. but we may have found that Bill was, got tired doing like side, you know, he might have liked side three more than the others, but yeah. I don't know whether we, he would have liked, you know, out in the city, <laughs> you know, he might have gone, guys, yeah, you know, I don't know whether I should be here, you know. So in fairness, I think Bill Bill's revolutionary style of drumming most probably needed Fripp, you know. It needed another guy who had a different concept and much more improvisational. I mean, yes, yes, did a lot of improvising, but it was usually based on a structure and it was usually on stage more than it was in the studio. So I think, you know, I admire Bill tremendously for leaving. If you leave a kind of hit band, um, you know, I, I think that that takes some admiration because it, it's quite unusual that somebody would, you know, work for years. And after Bill had been with the group five years or so, and nearly five years, and, and he, he really did love Yes, but he didn't like most, most probably where, where it might have been heading. Right. It's funny to talk about where it might have been heading. I, I interviewed Bill about a week ago. I don't know if you saw that, but... Uh, I asked him uh, if he felt he could have contributed anything to topographic oceans, and he, he said he's never he's never ever heard it. <laughs> so uh, um, I, I find that rather extraordinary, to be honest with you. But uh, anyway, we can leave leave that there anyway. But um, uh, one of yeah. my subscribers has asked, uh, "How did music that was so dependent on studio production techniques actually play out live?" I think the Beatles admitted that some of Sgt. Pepper was not going to be played live. But are there any parts of Close to the Edge that have proved to be a bit of a headache when it comes to the live arena? Well, there, there, are, two, there are two kind of answers. If you look at us in the 70s when we'd just written Close to the Edge and it was new and, and Bill left and Alan came in and he quickly learned stuff and we went out. The way that we were playing it then is evident on, on Yes songs. The, the level of uh, accuracy, the level of... Uh, uh, r- r- replication of, of what's in the studio. So, uh, so if that was to that at that point, close to the edge of the most complicated thing we'd done. You know, had a church organ in it. You know, it had had a lot of things going on. And and but but y- y- yes, just resolved that there was a way of playing this live. And whatever compromises we had to make, we had to make them, you know, otherwise we weren't going to play. Now, there are places where I've got a rhythm guitar, boom, da, 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 and I've also got, you know, single line. So, yeah, it, it doesn't aggravate me. It never has done. But I would obviously love to do both. <laughs> <laughs> but but they can't both be there. So what I did, and I think this is what all the band, every band member has done, same with vocals, is to say, well, look, what am I hearing most? And, and how can I get a bit of the support parts in while, and then I want to hear this. So basically to redesign the, the, uh, the overdub phase of, of Yes uh, is always uh, a challenge. Sure. And it always takes compromise, and I, I and I don't think anybody in an audience should expect that not to be the, not to be the fact. You know, it's a fact that you have to. So um, yeah, there are things that will be different, and uh, in a way that shows our uh, insight, if you like, into the music. What 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 we, what we choose to omit and what we choose to use as far as top lines and whether or not you know like for instance now Jeff whether Jeff can keep the pad going and do the twiddly line at the same time you know all that's a challenge and whatever we come up with is the best we can. 
Sure. I mean, didn't you? I think you mentioned in your your excellent biography that uh, uh, "Close to the Edge" was recorded in a um, a key that John Anderson couldn't reproduce live, so you had to take it down to E flat or something like that. Is that right? Right. I, I'd love to explain this because it's very exciting. Our new tour that's going to play "Close to the Edge" will play "Close to the Edge." the ending part the last two minutes actually for the first time ever in the right key wow we, we've we've we redesigned the 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 way that the top line of the lead vocal is sung and we're not it won't compromise that very much but yes i've asked before that yes play it in in the right key so what happens is we get to a certain point in it um which uh, I, I don't want i can't recap where it is but anyway we go boom boom Bum, bum, and we go off into the last da, 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 da. and usually we go bum 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 and we go off into a lower key b f minor to e flat but actually what we're going to do now is we're going to go a minor but 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 g minor jung to b flat minor and that is the same as the record so uh, the first night we do that on most probably every night we do that I, I, I will get a spine tingling sensation because I know how important that is to me because it's a bit like, you know, if you took Beethoven's music and said, oh, we don't want da 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 you know, we want da 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 you know, it'd be rubbish, you know. So in a way, we've always compromised the end of Close to the Edge due to the super high vocals that John could do in the studio, but just had to confess that he that he couldn't. So um, we've rearranged that and we intend, and I, I hope to God, now I've said it, that we don't um, back away from it. It's a beautiful thing. It's uh, yeah. the relation between two keys is very important. And the way Yes chose that key change was not only adventurous in the height that we were going to have to move the vocals into. They're yeah. not, not difficult for me, by the way, because one of the first things I said to the guys recently when I said, can we please play it in the right key? I, I added a little note, uh, be it not so important, but I can sing my part in that key <laughs> to give them confidence that at least they were going to get the bass part. The, ba the bass vocalist, me, was going to be able to sing it in the right key. So yeah, I'm very excited to do that, and and you, you didn't actually misquote me, but you know the key structures are, are are that we're not going to be going to F F minor E flat, but rather G minor, you know, and then moving down the chords. You know, it's right. it's going to be very nice. And John Davidson, the whole, yes. John Davison has arranged the vocals, so yeah. there might only be one note that he will he'll adjust so that it's not. But we will have the emphasis of the the correct key, and and, and, and I'd be surprised if the audience don't notice that that yeah. suddenly they're hearing us on stage and they might go, "Oh wow, you mean okay?" Because yeah. we always dumped the key and went somewhere else you know yeah, and yeah. so it was never quite as rich a uh, a moment you know if you like a, as rich a moment as it will be uh, when we're on stage now okay um with uh, you and i i'm, I'm just curious as how, it seems to be your guitar tunings that's at the, the beginning of that song and uh, who are you saying okay to exactly in in that one right well what's going on there is that um yeah, it's Eddie. Eddie must have said to me on the headphones, we're ready. And I go, OK. And I start playing. Now, I, I can't remember if we predicted that this, what I'm doing before, there isn't any tuning, but I'm sort of improvising on harmonics across the 12 string, which is a very delightful sound because, you know, yeah. you're getting octaves on all these harmonics. So I was like noodling, if you like. And, and then I got to that point where I said, OK. Now, one theory could have been in my mind and everybody's mind that when I said okay it would start so and you and I could have started glong glang glong and that was mm -hmm. it straight in glong glang glong you could have started like that but I guess we thought it was quite nice you know this harmonic thing and then the fact that I said okay is kind of unusual but it's it creates sort of beautiful intimacy I think where you feel like you're almost there you know, you, you're sitting there with these guys and they're playing this music. So I think that's rather lovely that we never edited it off. We would have, you know, conventionally, it would have started glong, 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 and that's the end of it. But it starts with those harmonics. So, so much to the 
opportunities that yes have given me as a guitarist you know oh. they've never i mean after all when i played them clap they said stick it on the album and i wasn't expecting them to say that on the yes album but basically i just played i said i've got this tune you know i'm quite excited about it. doodly boodly 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 and they all sat there going yeah yeah that's great let's put it on the album and i thought i'm not going to miss this opportunity <laughs> Sure, I'm not sure. turning that down because I, I sensed it was a key moment, a very unusual thing to have on a on a Yes album. After all, there'd already been two, and yeah. now there was three, and on it was was Clap, and I was uh, given an opportunity. Unfortunately, John, on the announcement linked to it, said uh, Steve's going to play the Clap, which wasn't the title, right. <laughs> but it became the title for about three years until I repeatedly wrote to Atlantic and said, I don't care what you got to do. But that song has got to be called Clap, and it was properly registered as Clap, and that's what it was called. In fact, there's a funny story that not, I don't know whether it's in my book, but I think Bill, Bill, uh, Bill and I were sitting, I didn't have a title, and, uh, 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 and so he said to me, well, w what do you want people to do when you hear this? And I said, well, I want them to clap. He said, right. well, call it Clap. <laughs> so it was kind of out of a conversation with none right. other than Bill. Uh, the, the title came. I, I think I should have thought of a better title uh, and the connotation of the clap was was really upsetting for me and right. it marred my pleasure of of that because, you know, we were not we were not going where that goes. So clap really suffered for a while because of the the announcement that John did. But, you know, you live with these things. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's. Uh... It seems to be a, a, a wonderful piece inspired by Chet Atkins. Uh, um, do you are you still um, influenced by by him when you're composing now? Do you still f feel his influence at all? Totally, yeah. I can't stop it. I mean, sometimes I I kind of think I'm moving across to Mel Travis or some other guitarist uh -huh. who who inspired him. I mean, Les Paul is a big. I think Les Paul is the guy I most probably was even more inspired by little did i know it because i didn't kind of choose les paul he was in my family's record collection and uh, i just put those records on and went wow listen to this record you know somewhere there's music so les was incredibly influential but i never thought of him like that because i discovered for myself chad atkins and when i heard him you know it was pretty instantaneous uh, 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 Teensville is the album I first got and then I said to myself I want every record this guy's ever made Th this is it so out of all my um, sort of like left and right field guitarist you know if you look over the left you know John Williams Julian Breen you know the great back of the Lucia all the great classical guitars over here you've got Wes Montgomery Tal Farlow and you know all, all the great guys Kenny Burrell and in the middle you've got the kind of rock guitarists and 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 people that were, were wonderful you know Mick yeah. Green uh, Brian Griffiths from England and Albert Lee from England you know lots of English guitarists but obviously America had a fascinating amount of guitarists yeah. but when i heard chet yeah and i'm still to this day uh, chet is is the top guitarist with me he, he just has something that connected with me that basically educated me in 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 diversity and uh, versatility because yeah. most guitarists and i think all the guys i've mentioned really do one thing that they, they play one style of music beautifully dedicatedly and marvelously, but Chet wasn't like that. Chet, Chet's color, which mm -hmm. maybe is explains why I, I move around in so many different ways, which I, is one of my main enjoyments in music, is to move around and not be restricted in style. And, and so Chet really took me completely by surprise, and and he became my driving force and my inspiration in so many ways. The way you know, not only the country picking, which is part of clap, of course, but the other the other side of him is that he moved into like the other side of Chet, what was it, an album on classical guitar, although it wasn't classical music. It was more like Spanish and, and popular music done on, cla on classical. But I would say that there's another guy uh, equally that I heard before I made my own choices um, on the records by Tennessee Ernie Ford, uh, who later went into gospel, which is not 
nothing to do with what I'm talking about. But no. before he went gospel, he basically had uh, a, a, a kind of country swing band. And in there were two guitarists, one of the only duo guitarists who were enormously successful in demand was Jimmy Bryant and Speedy West. So no. the, uh, he played, Speedy played the steel and uh, Jimmy Bryant played a telecaster. And those guys inspired, you know, Albert Lee a lot too, because I basically heard them and, and I didn't always disseminate between the Telecaster guitar and the pedal steel because they were intertwining all the time. And basically when they made their own records, because they, they did make quite a few of their own albums, they basically said, to, said that what they did was they arrived at the studio, a three hour session, and they just exchanged some riffs and then they recorded three songs, you know, three tunes based on anything they had you know they put it together but it's remarkable so but that influenced me a lot because of the steel guitar and I, and I brought steel guitar into my playing really uh, excitingly uh, for my extension of you know playing different styles was then because yeah. I didn't wobble about and go me a lot on the yeah. guitar I could on the steel and I felt that I was in the right place to go you know and yeah. be kind of spooky <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's a long answer. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's fine. I mean, uh, um, the one question I, I'm, I've been dying to ask you, it's probably a bit cheeky, really, is that in 1972, when Close to the Edge came out, uh, Jethro Tull released Thick as a Brick. Now, Ian Anderson has said that um, in part, this album was a gentle ribbing at all these prog bands that were taking themselves way too seriously. Were you aware of this album? And did you feel it was a prog parody at the time? A bit of a prog parody. What, what his albums are probably his album, yeah, thick as a brick. Right. Well, um, let's just put the record straight. I mean, our first opening into America was opening for Jethro Tull. Oh, wow. So that was an experience we never, you know, we could never thank them enough for. And in Edmonton, Canada, you know, in 1971, we opened up for Jethro Tull on quite an extensive tour of America. And this did us a lot of good because we didn't really know what the audience were that liked Jethro Tull, but there was a heck of a lot of them. And they yeah. were very popular, like, you know, ELP and, and some of the other bands had got in there before us. So when we toured with Tull, we, we, we thought the world of them and, and, you know, they were our mates and everything and we had a good time. But I've read that, I read that myself, that, that comment about Thick as, Thick as a Brick being a sort of parody of it. I don't know whether he's, um, whether, he, I mean, he, I, I can't say oh, he's not being uh, clear on that, but if it was a parody, it was a very early. I mean, I like Monty Python a lot, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I revisit Monty Python every you know few years. I just bought the the eleven CD box DVD box set of everything they did on series one to four, right. and so uh, I know what parody is. But I I don't really. You know, I, I don't think I'm, I'm fit to answer that question, really, to be quite honest, because I don't really know. I mean, he knows if it was a parody. If he was parodying the idea, I, I think he was like us. He wanted to take music to somewhere that was uniquely Jethro Tull. And, and, and that's, exactly what, oh. that's exactly what Ian did. So I, I would say only he knows. That's the quick answer. <laughs> Well, it, it's, uh, you know, it's funny because, you know, um, the Passion Play album, which they did next, was indeed a, a very proggy album, really. But uh, another question I have, actually, is in 1968, you almost stood in for Sid Barrett. I mean, uh, had you stood in for Sid Barrett, do you think the prog trajectory of the 1970s would have been very different? <laughs> there you go. I mean, not only was I, was I asked to replace... Uh, uh, to go to an audition for Jethro Tull in themselves and and Atomic Rooster, but that opportunity on um, uh, Nice was another one. You know, another yeah. that. So all of those could have changed the the direction of my work within prog, but certainly that one that happened. Um, you know, I think it was 1967 actually. But yeah, I was asked to, to stand in for Sid because you know that they'd lost him. Or he'd yeah. lost himself somewhere. Yeah. And I was much disappointed not to get that opportunity because I did get to the show on time and I was ready with my guitar, but Sid showed up. So yeah. I thought, uh, well, you know, good and bad. I mean, good yeah. for Sid, but bad for me. And um, I know that, that um, you know, 
the the way that that the way that played out particularly with roger waters was most probably that he was delighted you know to get dave in and play guitar to get somebody like me who's a solid player you can rely on me i'll show up i'll play i'll play the right notes in the right order and yeah. i'll be in tune but sid was on another plateau you know yeah, yeah. Uh, due to some indulgences we won't go into but basically he was a bit of a space cadet and mm. somehow that, that that's the reputation the group had so um, yeah, it, things could have been very different. Yeah, I mean, I was itching, but there again, a little bit earlier, of course, when Brian Jones died, I was, you know, pretty upset about that. But I thought maybe I could get in the Rolling Stones. Yeah. <laughs> There's a story I don't yeah. tell often. But no, I... my ambition was was that I had great ambition, and 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 any opportunity that would that that would uh, elevate me would be one I would be interested in. So in fact, I didn't know who to contact, but I was available, Mick and Keith uh, <laughs> at that time, but they didn't, we didn't know each other. So I couldn't like nose in on it. So those missed opportunities are, are quite tantalizing really, yeah, because yeah, nice yeah. was another one, you know, I won't go elaborate much about it, but you know, I had a day playing with Keith Emerson in nice and it was amazing. I mean, right. we got on so well. We kept trading Vivaldi licks. You know, well, didn't you, know you ask uh, Keith Emerson to join? Yes. In 1974, didn't you ask him to join to replace I Rick? Did. Yeah, you think that I would did. have worked? He well, yeah, I did think it would work, but of course he was, you know, he was understandably uh, happy because you know I think I quote it in the book that he said to me, "Well, why would I join?" Yes, you know, yeah. I got ELP, but I said to him, "Well, like, yeah, but look at our harmony. We've got three part harmonies, you know, and uh, basically." A guitarist, a full-time guitarist. I mean, Greg did some wonderful things for the guitar, but but he wasn't full-time, you know. So I was trying to persuade Keith, you know, to come in and think about it. But that would have been a big pull. And like you say, and another thing is if Van Gallis had worked out, which would have been sort of somewhat of a miracle. But but his presence in the rehearsal room was was immense. But yeah. maybe that was it. He was already. Uh, uh, fairly uh well not fairly but uh, but a very capable solo performer as well even at that stage he hadn't really done that yet but you know but he was already a formidable musician to play with and we loved loved doing that but it just didn't work because he was a bit like bill he wanted more spontaneity in the music he didn't want to be tied down with do you want me to play the same thing i just played he said no, no. i don't do that so we needed somebody who would learn parts and play them. And of course, you know, we had lots of keyboard parts that Van Gallis most probably would have reinvented and yeah. you might not have recognised them. Yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, my Zoom are telling me I've only got five minutes uh, before they're going to unplug Five me, minutes. Unless I pay you. I wonder if I can get a yeah. quick question in. Is uh, uh, Susie Cream Cheese joined you on stage. Did you ever get to jam with Frank Zappa? Well, no, but I, you know the story that we met Frank Zappa. He came yeah, to see yeah. us. Yeah. He came to Twink's flight. Twink went and got Keith and I said, are you serious? Twink said, yeah, I, wait here and I'll go and get Frank. So, no, we didn't have a jam, but uh, the time he came in the flat and told me that he, he loved the guitar solo in Claremont Lake, blew me away. You know, that's the kind of thing that's given me tremendous confidence. Isn't only the, like Georgie Fame said of me on my uh, second single with the Syndicats, right. when he heard me, I think it's called, uh, did it, you know, I don't know. He said he said something about the guitarist. He said, oh, that guitarist is quite good. <laughs> right. So I, I, I I always react to encouragement and I think that's that's totally normal, you know. So yeah, get, getting a compliment from Frank Zappa at that point was was beyond beyond my wildest dreams. I, I hadn't yeah. imagined that, that he even knew who tomorrow was, but he actually quoted Claremont Lake and right. said he liked the guitar solo. And it is actually, looking back, it, it's a hell of a guitar solo, uh, the kind of thing that you can only do in a trio. Now, the odd thing is, it's one huge, most probably regret of mine. Well, two regrets. One is that I don't have more time, although I'm going to in the future, to play, I hope, solo guitar, because that is my absolute dream of uh, yeah. of uh, music, is when I'm playing solo. But the other thing is, uh, you know, playing with other choice musicians uh, w w just would have been in, you know, really enhanced me. I lost the plot there. So you've got time for another question if, you, if you've got any. 
There's a wonderful line in, um, according to John Anderson, the line, in her white lace, you could clearly sla- uh, see the lady or something like that from yes. the closest. It you brought over from an earlier song. I'm just intrigued to know what that song was. Well, it wasn't a song. It was a, it was a struct. I mean, what you hear is what I wrote. So you yeah. can't hear the chords. Well, the chords are not very subtle because they're just being played in, in fours. Gene, Gene, and we go, in her white lace, you could yeah, hear. Yeah, yeah. But that tune is a kind of slightly jazzy tune if you heard it, you know, if you heard the chords as vamps behind it, you think it was a kind of jazzy thing. I was really thrilled that John liked some of my songs and we yeah. used them. In fact, you know, I did write the Close to the Edge Chorus. So basically, in her white lace was really, really something important to me. And it was based on the story of Bernadette, you know, yeah. and uh, her sacrifice and and her you know so basically um when somebody asked me about close years about the religious connotations the only thing i can say is that you know we weren't church goers but we were spiritual in, in our own you know young way and that the one example is that that story is is based on the 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 uh the stories of bernadette oh, and wow. um so i kind of feel good about that really <laughs> Good, good. It's Fascinating. Nice. Um, Steve, thank you so much for, for doing this interview and good luck with the tour, by the way, which I believe, when does that kick off? Soon? Is it happening it now? It's 15th of June right, in Glasgow. I think, right. I think, I think I'll be going to the Nottingham show, actually. I think I'm going to that one, but uh, okay. best of luck with that right. tour. And, uh, right. and I uh, thank you for doing this interview. I, I wish, have a wonderful, wonderful day. Okay, then thanks, Barry. It's been nice talking to you, and yeah. we'll catch up when I see you in uh, whatever it is, whichever yeah. one. <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye bye. Bye.